معكم في هذه الجلسة التي فيها ثلاث أوراق الورقة الأولى للدكتور حامد حامد علي وهو من عنا من هنا أستاذ مشارك في برنامج الإدارة العامة وحاصل على الدكتوراه من جامعة تكساس. and has his PhD from Texas University in Austin and he has held many teaching positions before. He is an associate professor at the American University in Cairo. He has many publications to his name. His uh, presentation is entitled Rapid Support Forces in Sudan from Militia to Army. I, am, I must tell you, the, uh, give you a disclamation. <laughs> I, am, I have nothing to do with anything he's going to say about uh, uh, rapid the support forces in Sudan. In سأتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية. Very quickly, I was asked by Amra Ashur to do this presentation, and they gave me four days to respond it quickly. So I went and wrote this is a case study. The interesting part of it, there is no theoretical foundation because I didn't know what to put it over there, but it is an idea that going to be developed in the future. So feel free to to bring any ideas, and I bet you are going to get a lot of good comments to develop this case study. Uh, for the rapid uh, support forces in Sudan, uh, this is a militia and uh, it's going through the evolutionary process, so I will will go there and hopefully you could, uh, you could interject. Uh, first, there is a, I will go into over the research question and we are going to move toward the, the co this rapid support forces is going to be moving on the direction of the conventional force. And also we will try to bring something that important, the leadership of Hemeti. This is, a, this is a Muhammad Hamdan Daglo, Hemeti, that is his nickname. Uh, very interesting character. Uh, he's rising to the power. Uh, uh, sometimes I feel, I, feel, I feel happy that somebody coming from very poor background to rise on the top, but also he's coming with a lot of baggage of the crimes he has committed. And then we're going to talk about the, uh, the economic power of, of the RF, uh, RSF and what is the future. Okay, you see that picture is uh, probably, this is me. A few years ago, I was visiting the rebel movement because I was asked to help them to reconcile and to unify. So I was there and, uh, and uh, I met with them and met with their leadership. We did a lot of good things, but anyway, later on, uh, 36 didn't work it out. So that was, I was a little bit younger than today. Uh, that was in 2000, uh, 2009 and 2010. So Dr. Abdulhab, you are right to, to bear away from what I do. Uh, if you look at the, at the, I call it the men with no mercy. Uh, and that is not because of uh, their behavior. And this is now, this is a force that is created by the elites in Khartoum. They created them so that they can suppress the margins, the marginalized. They can attack the hinterlands in Darfur and in Blue Niles and etc. Now those forces come back. So I will call it that is chicken coming home roasted. And that's what is happening today. So they come to Khartoum. They took the arsenals of the army. They have forced that in the size of 60 to 80,000. And these fighters are now about 30,000 in Khartoum alone. About another 30 in Yemen, and they reduce the number, and 15,000 in Darfur. So that is roughly the numbers. And he is recruiting now more and more forces. And the dynamics of the force also, there are foreign fighters within this force embedded on it, especially from Chad. I will speak very briefly about that once. Uh, and also you see that is even Boko Haram are now embedded in these forces. Okay? Uh, if you look for their equipment, these are the very simple rudimentary. They just have a rifles, 
uh, grenade launchers and pickup truck. Very light basics because this is a symmetric, is symmetrical warfare. Army cannot fight with the rebels. And these are also, some of them are rebel fighters as well that government recruit them. So they are using the same tactics of fighting, just attack and because they are coming from the Chadian tradition. Okay, and I myself also from Darfur, so we have the fight we're going to be not from a distance fighting. Very close proximity, sometimes you can attack with the vehicles. And sometimes you see that in a, in a war, thousands of vehicles are being destroyed because you just go and attack with the vehicles as well as. So that's why uh, tend to be very, very robust uh, force. Uh, okay, if we look at the, the research question is, also I'll give the credit to Amr Ashur, because Amr Ashur, when he was encouraging me to write, he said, uh, he, he wrote this research question. Actually, that's the easiest one, somebody writing a question. So he wrote this question and said, okay, would you look for the, 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 the combat capacity of the, of the, of these rapid response uh, forces, and how is they earn this political influence? And what is their future of this force? So uh, make it my work much easier. Okay. Uh, if we talk about the Himetis, the Himetis are very, because the force is around him, surrounding this character. And for his history, he's a, he's a Chadian immigrant, son of the Chadian immigrants who come in 1980. He came to the North Darfur. They told him that is, you are not welcome here. You don't have a land. They went to the, uh, he went to uh, uh, South Darfur. And they took a place that is owned by the four tribes, call it Dugi. And then they changed the name, call it Umm al Qura, the mother of villages. Because in the Sudan, we have uh, this hallucination. We want to Islamize everything, even the names of the land. So the land became, they call it Umm al Qura. Uh, he was there, he is a school dropout from the third uh, primary school. He dropped out from primary school, third grade. And then he became a camel herder. And he was, uh, you see the picture that on the bottom there, right? You see this picture? This is, the, oh, I can't see well. This is, this is him. When he was in 2004 and five, he's considered him as an emir of, uh, of the, of the Janjaweed. And then later what has happened is the government stopped giving them their salaries. At that time, he called himself the unknown soldier, a Jundil Mujhul, or Jundil Muslim, he was saying that once. And then he was sending a message to the Khartoum government saying that is, I am going to be uniting with the rebel movement in the rest of Darfur to fight you. And he said, we're gonna fight you to the day of judgment, until the day of judgment. That time, they invited him to Khartoum, and his career started in 2007. That's the time that he was, uh, uh, he got a title. They gave them all the due pays for his men. He was promoted during that time, and he was invited to Khartoum, and he got the position to become advisor to the South Darfur governors. After that, this is the, he got this job by blackmailing, and, and he continued things then. Today now he is going to be, he is on the Supreme, uh, in the, in the uh, Supreme Council. Uh, he considered himself a vice president. Uh, there is nothing called a vice president, but he calling himself vice president. And so he is a vice president. Now he has the wealth, he has the power, he has uh, significant force in Khartoum, plus he is having the support and the favors of Riyadh and the UAE. Okay, he's not a fan, Egyptian doesn't like him. Because he is wanting to create another pillar of the army, the UAE is interested to dis disband the Sudanese army to use this as a militia that they can use it for future, future wars. How they come to, the, to power? This is returning to al-Bashir. Al-Bashir is a very transactional leader. Okay, and most of the Sudanese politicians tend to be transactional. And that's why the country never went forward. And so as a transactional leader, in 2008, Jim, Justice and Equality Movement, has attacked Khartoum. Since then, the Bashir felt that they, he cannot rely on the army. And that's the time that he's tried to look for, the, for, the, for any type of militias. Uh, what he's done is he just gave them even more funding. More funding, and he recruited them, and he said this is a better way to fight 
this asymmetrical war. Uh, and indeed, uh, he was successful. Hamiti was very successful, uh, especially toward the end. Not because he has a fierce fighter, but he has a very good intelligence and, and, and too much manpower, because he will attack the rebel movement with 400 vehicles, while those guys will have uh, 40, 35 vehicles. So it's, that's when that is, so he's giving the intensity of fire, that giving him a lot of headway uh, forward. Uh, if you look for the, uh, the security establishment in, in, in Sudan, uh, also they are divided. And the, the regime itself was very interested to keep the balance. So uh, they created the pillars. You have the army, you have the internal intelligence security, you have the rabid uh, support forces of Hamidi on one side. They are all there. Uh, and Hamidi is a very entrepreneur, I mean, uh, very intelligent. You don't, have to be, you don't have to go to school to be intelligent. So he was quite intelligent and he was taking every opportunity. Uh, and he's willing to take the risk. The army became not risk taker. The army became quite conventional. They try to move and they cannot, uh, they need a lot of logistics and they are not effective. Because I was, when I met with this rebel movement, uh, one of them, they gave me certain numbers of, of war. They engaged battles with the government. Out of 130 battles, the government and, and rarely won any one of it. So that was not effective. So I think Hamati was, was, was a good recruit for the government to do the job. And the soldiers are not paid well. Hamati's salary for sir, men is equivalent to one soldier, five army officers who are not making that amount of money. Institutionalization of, of the of the rapid support forces. Uh, the government created the act called the 2017 Act. This is an act that officially makes this is a is a is of uh, an institution of the state. The EU has played a big role on this because the EU want to deal with this uh, with Hemeti to secure the borders from the human trafficking and etc. So they said you need to institutionalizing it, and that's when they make the act. Uh, and then they become under the direct control of the presidency at this time. They used to be part of the National, Secur National Intelligence uh, and Security Service. Now they become directly uh, accountable to the president, and they become as a quasi guard to the president. And this is when they become, they create that pillar. They become a third power to check everyone else. And that's why when they try to remove the al-Bashir, it was very complicated that they need to reconcile between those three forces, the army, the intelligence and, uh, and the rapid response forces. Uh, of course, Hemeti was, was promoted very quickly to a Brigadier general, and then he become, and then he become a general, uh, bypass every norms of the military institutions. Of course, some people are, are, are very, uh, people in the center, they don't like him, not in a sense that is, uh, Sometimes it comes very close to like a racism type of a mentality. Uh, he shouldn't be a president, but I'm just saying to the people, if al-Bashir become a president, why not him? will be a president. I don't see any difference. I don't see any difference. They're all, uh, you know, they're all fighters, so why not? Uh, okay, uh, for the combat capacity is, I think their vehicles, they have about 5,000 to 8,000 vehicles. This is SUV trucks that they use it. Uh, this is what is, uh, and simple things. This is what they have. But now they are moving to another direction, okay? And now they are training pilots, and that's why I'm saying they are moving towards becoming a conventional force. So the enemy is no longer the rebel movement, so the enemy will be the institutional army. So to confront that, you need to have, because the army have, a, have, a, have armors, have a, have a fighters yet, so you need to neutralize this. And now they, are, uh, they send pilots to be, uh, to be trained in Ethiopia, in Belarus, in the UAE, and even in Saudi Arabia. They are training the pilots. Uh, and also they are, they are trying to acquire some planes and they're looking for their own airports. And now they are doing something in Darfur, creating their own airports. Uh, also they're getting the anti-aircraft. So this is all showing that is they must do something with the army in the future. And of course, there is a possibility they could be integrated into the army. But I don't think Hamati was interested in that notion. But he's not coming across, but he was thinking it's another pillar on the army, because the day that they integrated means his, his future will be in, uh, in, 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 
very bleak in future. Though the power sharing declaration, or what's called the constitutional declaration, has clearly stated that is the army should be integrated. And this is basically even the position of Egyptian government. They think that is the army, this should be integrated into the army. And the UAE is thinking that is this supposed to be the army, that they use it for their own mercenary and other objectives. All right? The other pillow that is making Hamati's strength is about the gold. And this gold is really is, is putting him in trouble, by the way, because of the money laundering. And the global witnesses are making big investigation. I am aware of that ones. And they make a report that coming out in the Guardian. And so he's making about four tons of gold per month. That's equivalent to $140 million from Jabal Amir, and not Jabal Amir alone. He has other places in South Kudufan, and he has other places also in the, in the north, uh, uh, northern part of Sudan as well. And also, he's, uh, he's getting about $30 million per month because he had the 30,000 fighters in Yemen. So he'll get $1,000 per every fighter per month. So that is money that he's going to get it, 30,000. And the salaries, it's about $85 million that he's going to get. And then they will transfer it to the Sudanese currency and using the official exchange rate. And he's also making some benefit. So he's getting mostly about $255 million. And his equity, he himself, his equity is almost close to $1 billion. Okay. So he has the power. So he can, and now he's buying elites. The, you know, he's, he's buying the elites. These elites are so cheap and so many professors now, they are carrying the bags around him and they're getting paid. It's very sad, isn't it? All right. Uh, climbing the political ladder. Uh, uh, it's good that he's climbing the political ladder. I, I feel that is. Bless somebody coming from this margin. I was telling the, some of the colleagues, if you don't want to bring somebody from Nuba Mountain to be the president of Sudan, let somebody come from Darfur, even if it is Himeti. Uh, you know, let him come. What's the, what's the issue there, right? So, uh, so when we look at him, on during the revolution, he took a stand. Because the Bashir might be staying in if he was not taking the side. So he said that is, they brought him to Khartoum in December 2019. But he said that we are not here to suppress anyone. We are going to support the legitimate demand of the people. That was a position that he stated, and it was quite helpful uh, to, to pave the way for the removal of al-Bashir. Uh, so he was very instrumental on that, people appreciating that once. If he stayed in that position, I think he could easily take the power out of Burhan. Burhan is... Uh, because what's his name is uh, Ashraf, my friend. Ashraf called him Habannaka. And I said, what's Habannaka? And I look, for the, I look on the dictionary, on the Dawah dic historical dictionary. I could not find the word Habannaka. But when I asked other people, they told me this is means torture. Uh, this, uh, so uh, I told him, be careful. You don't want to insult the head of a state. But anyway, that's Ashraf's responsibility. <laughs> uh, what has happened is, what has happened is, he became the power. He became the center of power. His rivalry was Salah Goj, the intelligence guy, and he pushed him out of the country. And then he pushed Ibn Auf, the, one, the guy that was stint in power for one day, and he was removed. And Hamiti was instrumental in removing him, and also he's instrumental in bringing Burhan because he worked with Burhan. And Burhan is no longer, you know, he's, he's, he's a person that is not ambitious enough to do anything, he is willing to be a shadow, he's willing to be a second person uh, online, not, not the right person. So means, okay, good, all right. So let's, let's move uh, very quickly. Uh, so basically is, we see that the army is, nobody trusting the army, even Burhan is not trusting the army. The military transition council doesn't trust the army because they are coming from the, they didn't have the consensus of the army to move on because they were, the part of the security apparatus that they took over the power. So they are not trusting the army. The army could make another move. And that's why Hemeti was, was, was playing on that once. And then he brought his forces in Khartoum to secure the strategic locations, and they control the arsenals of the army. So uh, now he's calling himself as a vice president because there was a rumor that is, uh, Burhan medically is, is, has a medical problems. There is a possibility he could be removed by the army or army will take it over. So he's asserting himself as a vice president. So if the president is, not there, is no longer there, the vice president should step in. So, uh, so possibilities that he could be a president. 
if it is, if things will go uh, unexpectedly on a direction. But I don't see any difference between him and Burhan, right? Uh, so uh, the other thing that people consider him, he's a savage and warlord. He's taking that opposite. He's turning that into his own advantage. And he starts saying that is, I'm a leader of the excluded people, the marginalized people. I representing Darfur. I'm, now he's going there saying, I am a champion of the peace, talking to the rebel movement to try to bring them on the fold. Rebel movement now with him. So the question dynamic of Khartoum is, if the rebel movement coming in with uh, Hameti in one page, uh, uh, and then they were uh, they are coming there, and what they call the forces of uh, what that is, forces of change and whatever this stuff. So they are disintegrating. This is also a very opportunistic group that they are coming in, and they they they, they ride the wave of the revolution. But now they are disintegrating themselves, and we have a very weaker government weaker prime minister, weaker institution of governing, so it is possible that the army could, could revisit this once. Uh, so the, the other that important thing that is the evolution of them is uh, not only about the Saudis-led coalition, but also the EU has a playing role to strengthen them because they are asking them to take care of the trafficking. And when they asked that about this, Hemeti was doing the trafficking himself. He was used, he dismantled the other one's network, he created his own network, he kept trafficking people, and then telling the Europeans, if you don't award me with my hard work and efforts, I am going to open the border. But actually he was doing that, you know, he's just blackmailing everywhere and, uh, and living on it. Okay, so regional alliances and cultivating regional uh, relation. Uh, wait one minute, okay. All right, he has, he has a link with the Chadians because his, his cousin is the defense minister of Chad. So they invited a lot of Chadians to his army and they have an ambition to go back to Chad, one of them. Chadian opposition members are also within his force. Uh, we have a Central African Republic, Sika. Also they are part of his force. Uh, we have uh, Riyak Mashar one time part of it, but he's now that's not important at all. In Libya, they are fighting with the General Haftar. They have about 7,000, that is in Libya, that's the estimate. And the UAE and the Saudi Arabia and the Yemen war is all going to be added to that. So all these factors are working on his way. And the question is his future. <coughs> like this is a, Tubian Jerome said that flooring the monster may require more than unarmed protesters. So he is going to be, but he's. He's going to be indicted for the war crimes. This is my prediction, because I know that he was, they were interested on him, and one time they want to declare that, but for some reason they took it away, but he's going to go. Uh, his future, he has no future. Uh, he could ascend to the throne by force, but that's going to be a short life. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hamid. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, what comes from your uh, uh, from your presentation will lead us into the coming presentation because the issue how do you do how you do deal with paramilitaries uh, uh, after uh, things change and peace seems that they are difficult to dismantle I think as uh, this is the uh, what uh, Tiana Resevich uh, paper is she's, uh, uh, talking about the uh, the schedule of the never dismantled paramilitary units in Serbia. How uh, these shadowy organizations are still, in her uh, view, uh, influencing uh, politics in Serbia. Uh, Tiana is a researcher and PhD candidate at the University of Belgrade. Nice place <laughs> be there. Uh, she holds MA degree in international security from the Faculty of Political Science in Belgrade. Uh, since 2018, she has served as managing editor of the Journal of Regional Security. Her main academic interests are institutional design and intergroup relations in divided and post-conflict societies. Please, 15 minutes.
Thank you very much. And uh, I would like first to just thank the, the Doha Institute and Mr. Uh, Ashur for um, providing me with the opportunity to be here and, and discussing these important issues with you. So um, I assume that these acronyms in the title can confuse you and maybe perhaps uh, lead you even in a, uh, in a wrong direction, especially the DDR one and perhaps even the SSR one. And I'll come early, like uh, very quickly, I'll come to them. But um, I just want to first um, um, indicate that um, I will, in a way, move us uh, in at least two ways from the discussions we've had so far during the today and, and yesterday. First, I will um, move us uh, uh, geographically to the region we, we earlier in the previous panel came close to and uh, talk about uh, the uh, aftermath of the uh, war in the former Yugoslavia. And also I will move us in a way temporally to the, to the post-conflict phase, the phase which comes after the, the conflict is ended and uh, uh, the, the phase which the conflicts we were talking about uh, today and yesterday will uh, uh, soon come, uh, hopefully uh, providing some um, lessons, whether good or bad, uh, for, the, for the sake of, of, of these conflicts. And, and Western Balkans region in, in general has, been, has served as a laboratory for international national peace building enterprise. So drawing lessons from this region is, is not something I, uh, academia is actually prone to, but also the international community. Um, so this is the, uh, during my presentation, I will quickly go through some of the major theoretical debates I will, uh, uh, in the paper, try to uh, address. Uh, but uh, the, the final theoretical argument, the model, will be, will, are yet to be developed. So I will just quickly pass through, through uh, the, some of the theoretical puzzles we'll try to uh, reveal. Then I'll move to the case of the Serbian paramilitary units and skimming through the three major phases, uh, the transformation of these uh, paramilitary units have, <coughs> uh, have undergone since the uh, war until today. Sorry, can I just... Uh And then I will offer some tentative conclusions which are yet to be uh, uh, tailored uh, uh, as, the, as the work progress. So as for the theoretical debates we are trying to, to uh, uh, tackle through this paper, uh, well, as the same as the hybrid war, uh, as somebody mentioned earlier, this is probably older phenomenon than the, all the acronyms we put here are. So the practices of uh, disarmament, demobilization, transitional justice, reintegration, and security sector reform are probably as old as the wars themselves. However, the literature in this field is still young and, and still in need for some further empirical evidence, comparative studies, and more nuanced theoretical explanations and models. And um, the, uh, while the, since the research is quite young and still scarce, there are only a few consensus in the, in the literature on, on this issue. One of the consensus is that the DDR program saying that disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration of ex-combatants is a good thing, something which is desired and something which will help the former enemies to es escape this conflict trap and, and just uh, have a renewed uh, violence in the, in the uh, region. Then, um, however, for, actually for this reason, the DDR in the last two decades has become a part of a traditional peace building toolkit, something which has been now um, uh, uh, a usual thing in a peace agreement, something which is advised to be included in order to move parties towards the uh, disarmament. Um, however, since it became the part of this peace building tool toolkit, um, there is um, uh, uh, the, the attention of the scholars, but also practitioners, uh, has been uh, has realized that some of other the elements of the things which come after the uh, violence ends, which is the transitional justice, seeking to punish the wrongdoers, do hold them accountable, and also to prevent or deter from future wrongdoings such as those ones and also the security sector reform which aims at establishing effective security both for the states and its people uh, in the framework of accountability and, and uh, democratic governance are actually linked and uh, the, the link in the relationship the fact that they are mutually reinforcing is not it's quite commonsensical because they all 
tend to aim at uh, reconciliation, truth seeking, uh, establishment of effective monopoly over the means of violence, etc. However, they also suffer from, from different uh, tensions both in terms of their conceptual definition and, and normative underpinnings, but also the practical Im implications of, of these uh, three uh, um, uh, activities and mechanisms. Uh, for example, the, the DDR, the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, and transitional justice, uh, the tensions between them uh, mirror the, the well-known uh, dilemma between secur security versus justice, since DDR uh, scholars and, and also also advocates usually argue that, that stability should come before the justice and through seeking, etc., uh, on the line of argumentation that the end of violence is something which will actually downsize the suffer of the, of the victims and the people better than any through seeking or, or, uh, or criminal justice, etc. On the other side, transitional justice uh, is based on the principle of accountability, holding the wrongdoers accountable, and, and it is actually designed more for victims than for, than for uh, the, the combatants themselves. So all these, um, uh, these three mechanisms are practically designed by different stakeholders different, uh, uh, and for different beneficiaries, different groups, meaning that they can come, come in attention. The same goes with the DDR and security sector reform. Although the reintegration phase of the DDR is usually a natural point of intersection at the beginning of the, in a way, security sector reform, because it is that in that moment when the ex-combatants start looking for some new employment, either in the security sector reform, in the security state security sector, or if security sector reform uh, has failed, they usually go back either to par paramilitary units or to private security sector, often poorly or completely unregulated in a post-conflict and weak states, or, or to, to uh, uh, something which sends a message that the security sector reform at DDR has not been uh, um, uh, successful. However, the, the point here is, and the paper uh, wants to, to uh, draw attention uh, uh, and offer some empirical evidence to the fact that these three processes and demands often imposed by the international community have um, frictions between themselves and do not come as a straightforward process, but have to be better tailored always to the, to the specific uh, um, uh, cases and context. Um, uh, I will, sorry. Why is the case study of Serbia optimal for, for discussing these issues? Um, we'll maybe have some more time during the discussions, but one of the reasons is, uh, several reasons are actually these ones put here, because these are the, the gaps in the existing literature, which all of them, the case study of Serbia, can uh, address uh, uh, in the research. One of the things is that, um, that the existing literature on the DDR and these issues usually, uh, sorry. Sorry, uh, uh, usually tends to uh, um, uh, don't pay sufficient attention to the cases, to the countries which were not official parties in the, to the war, even though they were involved in the, in the wartime activities. So, um, as for Serbia, one of the uh, um, major counter arguments to the uh, often allegations for, uh, for expansionism, for aggression, for war crimes committed in the Bosnian War come have, have since the beginning of the war to until today been based on the fact that Serbia was in, in the former F Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was not an official party to the war because the uh, Yugoslav People Army, the, the army which was the, the army of the previous Federal Republic, withdrew from Bosnia in February uh, uh, 1992 and since then the, the army of the Republic of Srpska uh, was from the, like the entity from proclaimed entity in the uh, Bosnia Herzegovina was the official. That's where the Serbs uh, 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 fought, and in the paramilitary units, uh, different paramilitary units uh, which uh, fought in Bosnia. The same goes with Croatia, though this is a bit different story. Maybe we can have some time later. Then, so in in that way. Uh, um, 
that this also comes to the second thing that Serbia, the wage, the, the war in former Yugoslavia was never, never waged on the, Yugo, on the Serbian uh, territory, meaning that the, all the DDR mechanisms which were later asked from the international community did not practically relate to Serbia. No DDR programs, so programs aimed at disarmament and dismantling of the paramilitaries um, uh, from Serbia happened practically in Serbia. So I'll skip that, this, uh, we don't have enough time, but the, the point is that Serbia, despite the fact that it was involved in three wars in the last decade of the 20th century, Serbia could easily be marked as a country which has never undergone a proper uh, DDR uh, process. So um, I will look into, just uh, in order to, to uh, for the um, uh, development of the argument, what is necessary is to look first in the wartime relations between the paramilitaries and the uh, uh, Belgrade government, because this is um, th the nature of these relations actually decided that the, the further development of dismantling or not dismantling the paramilitaries in, um, in Serbia. Uh, so um, as for the number of Serbian paramilitaries in, uh, world in the Bosnian war, it's, um, this, is, this is one number which was uh, put in the UN Security Council report dedicated to the investigation of the war crimes committed in the uh, Bosnian conflict, and it says that there was 55 uh, Serbian paramilitaries involved in this war. However, the, the number is very provisional. It's very difficult to establish a, a, a number of, exact number of any paramilitaries in any conflict because the, these groups uh, often merge and split. The, the chain of commands usually uh, changes to the, to the level that it's confusing even to the combatants themselves. That was the fact in, in, in Bosnia. However, the fact is that the Serbian, the number of Serbian paramilitary units was the highest from among, uh, like, uh, indifferent to the, the, to the paramilitaries fighting for the Croatian or the, or the Bosnian SAR. Uh, the, as for the structure of these paramilitaries, they were combined of um, people, of, dif of men of different social background, different professional background, different age. The, as for the recruitment strategies, they were both formal and informal, through friends and family ties, even media ads, newspaper ads, um, sports, um, sports membership was also one of the important things because one of the strongest and perhaps cruelest paramilitary uh, units, uh, Serbian paramilitary units, the Tigers, by, led by Željko Rajnatović Arkan, was actually mainly comprised of the football fans of the food, famous football club, Red Star from, from Belgrade. Party membership was also one of the ways for, for, um, for mobilizing uh, paramilitaries because um, once the war in uh, Bosnia started, so the political parties in Serbia started competing among themselves, which one will better prove their you know, patriotic duties and, and, uh, uh, and their uh, readiness to defend the national interest, why you had a number of, of, of parties, well, a number of paramilitary units uh, tied to the political uh, leaders. One of this is um, Vojislav Šešelj, uh, who's, um, who also had, uh, so from the Serbian Radical Party, which also had its own paramilitary unit. Uh, however, despite this, all these differences, what make, made these uh, paramilitary groups uh, in a way uh, similar were that many of them had um, b informal but strong connections to the political elites in Belgrade. These networks were of different type. Um, on one part, they were practically based on the support which came in money, armament uh, and um, ammunition from the Belgrade, either left from the Yugoslav National Army when, uh, after withdrawing, or constantly uh, uh, pushed into the, uh, into, into the conflict territories. Uh, on the other side, these um, uh, ties were, and one of the, these, these photos actually are just illustrative here, because this, is, this was the, uh, the guy in the suit is actually the head of the Serbian Security Service, the major intelligence uh, agency. And the guy behind him, together with him, were sent already in the March 1991 to help the establishment and the training of the paramilitary unit, uh, the unit uh, in, um, in Croatia, in Knin, which will later move to, to Bosnia as well. Uh, but these ties were not only political and were not always, actually were not usually for, uh, for um, political reasons or some wholly national interests, but were often more banal 
lucrative and were related to the war economy, to the fact that uh, the paramilitary units were actually the major pillar of war economy involved in smuggling, trafficking of everything from food to, to arms. And there are many studies about the impact of the war economy established by paramilitary groups on even on the duration of the conflict, conflict providing some evidence that paramilitaries were often uh, uh, would uh, uh, even not restrain from, from ending the truce and ceasefire in order to just uh, even, uh, you know, attacking its own people uh, uh, in order to just have the war going and war economy uh, uh, flourishing. Um, um, the Serbian paramilitaries uh, were according to the, the later testimonies in front of the uh, testimonies and verdicts of the domestic trials, yes, uh, of the domestic trials, but also in front of the Hague Tribunal, the ICTY, were actually involved in, in a lot of uh, uh, mass, mass atrocities, war crimes, human rights abuses, uh, which is important for the, for the later phase. The second phase, which is important for understanding the, the flawed DDR process in Serbia, is the phase which comes after the end, which actually uh, represents the fusion or the integration. So in a way, the Serbia skipped the DD part of the DDR process and uh, went immediately to the reintegration of paramilitaries in the state security uh, system. Since the Dayton Peace Accord, which ended the war in Bosnia, did not have any detailed provisions on the DDR, practically the, the political elites in Belgrade were left on their own to do with the DDR process whatever they wanted, uh, including to, to practically skip it. So what p practically happened is that around approximately 10,000 people of ex-paramilitaries, but I have to make a note here that this number is uh, taken from the only study which tries to measure the, to count the numbers of paramilitaries because um, it might sound strange, but the Serbia does not have an official record of the people participating in the war, neither it has the official record of the wounded or the people um, uh, uh, killed during the wars in Bosnia, but also the same goes with with uh, uh, Kosovo. Bosnia could uh, the the, the thing we do not Serbia does not have an official record for the Bosnia war. Is also was part of this claim that S Serbia did not participate uh, in the war itself. What actually happened is, and I'll I'll come to to, to an end. What actually happened is that the, in 1997, the uh, head of the state Slobodan Milosevic decided to allow the Ministry of Interior to practically fuse several paramilitary groups, the strongest one, including the unit, the so-called Red Barrettes, you can see them um, here, to transform them into the special elite a unit of the police of the Ministry of Interior of, of Serbia. So without um, any vetting, without any uh, um, um, just screening for human rights abuses or without official disarmament, without official dismantling of the war command, they were just uh, brought into the state security system. To the level, the, the level of this, uh, uh, um, um, the, the, to the, it sends the message, the fact that the commander of the unit after its official establishment was actually the wartime commander of the unit who will later become ass assassinate actually the first uh, prime minister of the uh, Republic of Serbia. So uh, one of two reasons which for which this happened actually is the fact that these, this unit was uh, remained responsible only to Slobodan Milosevic and uh, to the commander of the unit, but no democratic or civil, civilian control could have been established over this unit. They became his personal Praetorian Guard, a death squad, mainly with two major tasks. One was the counterinsurgency in Kosovo, uh, uh, since the war in Kosovo was um, approaching, and the second thing was the, um, uh, his uh, uh, um, fight uh, against the political opponents and independent journalists, since the members, as the trials will show, members of this unit later were directly responsible for the assassination of many of the political opponents. And this is the, the final side, which, which actually, the, the fact that after the 2000s, when we had the democratic revolution in, in Serbia, um, the, um, uh, even though it was expected that the unit will uh, help Slobodan Milosevic stay in power because in uh, 1991 we had one during the protests of the opposition we had even the military tanks on the streets 
The unit was first expected on the day when a million people went out on the streets in Belgrade to ask for, the, uh, for Milosevic to recognize his loss on the election. The unit did not do anything. They practically uh, uh, stay in their military barracks during that day. Uh, while someone can, can um, um, think that this was a part of the um, um, rising democratic spirit and the fact that the, even the security intelligence st stood on the side of the uh, um, uh, uh, protesters and people's will. Um, the fact is that what, pro what, uh, what, what happened in the days before the 5th of October is that the uh, leader of the op democratic opposition created a, uh, some kind of pact with the head of the, the unit of mutual non-aggression. He promised to the uh, uh, um, leader of the unit that the unit would not be dismantled or charged for any human rights abuses if they refrain from uh, providing support to Slobodan Milosevic. Paradoxically, the logic of the future prime minister was to defend the nonviolent character of the democracy and, and prevent the blunder on the streets. And he did it for the, he practically abandoned democratic principles for the sake of, of democracy. This has led, however, to the situation uh, that created a strong veto player, a reserve domain which was completely untouchable to any reforms which were happening in the following years. And um, whenever something that the government would uh, accelerate its efforts for fight against organized crime or cooperation with the ICTY, the Hague Tribunal, because it was more and more pressure to do so for the sake of EU integration, the, the, these veto players will react. One of the strongest reactions was the, when they blocked the highway with their hammers and in uniform and um, asked, for, asked for the uh, resignation of the, uh, um, of the minister, of, the head of the security services and got it. Uh, so what uh, the, 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 the epilogue of such having such a, integrated such a strong veto player in a democratic now system was such that uh, on, in, uh, we soon had in 2003, we had um, assassination of the first prime minister committed by the members of the unit, the final sentence committed by the members of the uh, unit. And this, uh, 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 this, this event, together with this entire reserve domain, which s remained strong in, the, in this system, practically enabled the future security sector reform and created uh, some kind of um, uh, not only spir the spirit of impunity in the security sector reform, which started eroding in the operations of the police after the 2003. Many of the members were, including the, the, the head of the commander of the first commander of the unit, were later uh, arrested and charged for, the, um, for several assass political assassination, including the one of the prime minister. Uh, however, Despite this, this, this abandoning of this reserve domain uh, has started, it is yet unfinished and there is a lot of things to do before we acquire some democratic security sector reform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tiana. Very thoughtful and uh, uh, informative uh, paper. I hope to see the full paper. Uh, now uh, over to uh, Alan Hassassinian. Hassas who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Kurdish Studies Center at uh, Exeter. Uh, his research is on Kurdish-Iranian politics, Kurdish nationalism, national movements, security and armed movements. Uh, he received his PhD from Exeter. His uh, paper uh, is about the Peshmerga's transformation into a, an, an official army. 15 minutes. Great, thank you very much. And uh, hello to you. And uh, I would like to start with uh, thanking the organizer of this conference uh, for making this event uh, happen. So as the title of the uh, paper says, uh, from insurgent to uh, regular, the military and political for uh, implication of the Peshmerga of the Kurdistan region of Iraq's uh, transformation. Uh, this paper is about uh, uh, the process of uh, transformation and uh, modernization of the uh, political uh, organization, our military organization of the uh, Kurdish movement uh, and then the Kurdish administration in the Iraqi Kurdistan. And then this paper uh, highlighting some of those uh, uh, challenges in the way uh, this uh, Peshmerga transition 
process has uh, uh, experienced. And the main uh, argument of this paper is that, uh, well, a, transition, a uh, political transition has been initiated since the 19, uh, early 1990s. However, uh, due to the way the leadership of the Kurds uh, in the Iraqi Kurdistan, mainly these main political parties of the Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, PUK and KDP, also K Kurdistan Democratic Party and Patriotic Union of uh, Kurdistan have, have interacted uh, with uh, each other uh, has caused a uh, well a different stage of uh, interruption, uh, fail, and so on in the process of transition. So why this uh, research is important? Uh, it is because uh, the Kurdish regional government, uh, uh, well, uh, KRG, has an army composed of uh, about 200,000 uh, Peshmerga. Uh, counting as an unavoidable element of the Kurdish movement and Kurdish politics in Iraq. Uh, this organization, or organization has, as I said, been uh, through a seven decades of um, uh, evolution, which uh, transformation, uh, is transformation require a, a multi aspects of uh, study. Uh, well, uh, the Kurdish, uh, Kurdish region of Iraq, KRI, exists as an autonomous uh, region within the Iraqi uh, state, fed, uh, federal uh, Iraqi state. Um, in, in its status, however, uh, within Iraq is confused and uh, contested. The uh, KRI, uh, KRI maintains a range of military uh, uh, institution and forces, uh, which these forces collectively are uh, referred to as Peshmerga, uh, with some being commanded by the KRG, also the government, the Kurdish government, uh, under the uh, military of Peshmerga affairs, um, and uh, some other under the control, direct control of these uh, political parties, KDP and PUK. Uh, so, uh, despite several attempts, uh, depolitization of the Peshmerga forces uh, is yet far from realization. Nevertheless, before uh, starting with the, uh, well, uh, uh, with the current state of Peshmerga, a historical reflection on its emergence and evolution might be helpful for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of uh, Peshmerga. Uh, so the word Peshmerga translated, uh, if you translate it, is those who face death. Uh, while Peshmerga have become a staple of Kurdish struggle for liberation in different parts of Kurdistan in the Iranian, Iraqi, uh, mainly Iranian, Iraqi part of uh, Kurdistan. And uh, uh, here we can see images of uh, Kurdish uh, leader which uh, led the movement in the early uh, uh, late 19th century, century and early 20th century among them Sheikh uh, Abdullah Shamdini uh, uh, Simko as well as Sheikh Mahmoud Berzenji and the characteristic of this movement uh, in the uh, uh, first half of the 20th century has well, commonly been referred to as uh, tribally led uh, Kurdish uh, uh, insurgency. However, by the establishment of the uh, uh, Kurdish Republic in 1946 in, in the city of Mahabad in the Iranian Kurdistan, uh, the uh, Kurdish arm uh, movement or the section, which is the Peshmerga, have as well experienced uh, a, a huge transformation. So uh, the armed section of the Kurdish movement, uh, well, from being a tribal elite, uh, became a Kurdish nation. As army, as a national army. So the word Peshmerga has its uh, emergence from this period, and mainly uh, through this period, we can see actually a Kurdish leader, uh, among them uh, Mustafa Barzani from the Iraqi Kurdistan, with some thousand Peshmerga contributed to uh, this short life uh, republic in, in, in the Iranian Kurdistan. And going back to the uh, 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 Peshmerga in the Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, the 1958 is actually a uh, historical year of the uh, re-emergence and re-evolution of the Peshmerga. And then through this period, uh, we uh, there are there have been record numbers of uh, massive fighting bet between the Peshmerga of the Iraqi Kurdistan and uh, the Iraqi Army, with creating different challenges to uh, to the state army. Uh, so uh, the the thing is that. Actually, uh, in 1975, 
the uh, Peshmerga uh, with a numbering about uh, 100,000 uh, uh, experience first uh, kind of modern disintegration. And it's ha happened because of uh, our, in the aftermath of the Algeria's agreement between Tehran and Baghdad, which was signed and uh, at, at, at this, the, this period. Uh, however, we see again the uh, Peshmerga re-emerged in the 1980s, and then uh, they were uh, able to, uh, through the eight years of Iranian and uh, Iraqi war, create different kind of uh, challenge to the state. So here is just the image of Peshmerga actually before the disintegration of the uh, KDP uh, Peshmerga army uh, at, that per at, at that period. So. Uh, what is important in this regard is that, uh, as the paper argues, uh, we see a systematic uh, attempt to transforming uh, the uh, Peshmerga uh, f as a non-state uh, armed group, uh, which has uh, started. This transformation in an evolution is uh, has uh, well uh, is rooted in a historical period of Kurdish politics in the Iraqi Kurdistan, which is mainly related to establishment of the KRG, Kurdistan Regional Government, uh, after the uh, first uh, uh, Gulf War and um, well, uh, some part of the uh, Kurdish territory were liberated and the KRG was established. So, 1991. Uh, 1992, uh, because of the establishment of KRG as well as uh, creation of the first ministry of Peshmerga Afaya, we can see that the step was uh, taken by uh, PUK and KDP. However, uh, we see that, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the attempt was about to transform in Peshmerga from a mountain guerrilla to a organization that is uh, defending and uh, capable of being defend rather than uh, conducting, as I said, uh, guerrilla activity. Uh, however, uh, this process has been utterly interrupted following the eruption of the 1994-97 uh, 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 civil war between KDP and P um, PUK. Another stage of uh, uh, transformation has uh, has been initiated uh, following the uh, so-called Washington Agreement, which was a American attempt and mediation between PUK and KDP to uh, ending the civil war. So. Uh, in this regard, uh, unification of the Peshmerga was an important and critical uh, uh, element of this uh, peace agreement, Washington agreement. Then uh, the th thing is that in reality, uh, it just stayed on the paper and no real attempt was uh, taken by KDP and PUK to uh, well, uh, reunified and depolicized this uh, this uh, force, and then we see in in 2003 uh, another uh, well uh, historical uh, moment in the uh, well uh, transformation of Peshmerga because uh, before that Pe Peshmerga was a uh, isolated. Uh, regional uh, force, uh, just uh, quite uh, territorially limited, then suddenly became a partner, international partner and ally of the American in uh, fighting and uh, overthrowing the uh, Saddam Hussein regime in, in, in Baghdad. Then um, uh, we have 2004 and five because in this period, uh, actually for the first time, in the literature it has mentioned, but uh, looking deeper in this, into the uh, uh, history of the Kurdish movement and Kurdish relation with Baghdad, uh, actually uh, it is second time uh, that uh, the Kurds and the Peshmerga has been uh, recognized as a, a regional national army by the Iraqi constitution. So uh, the first time was in 1996 through the uh, Al-Bazaz uh, declaration, and then we see again uh, with uh, the idea of reshaping a new Iraq, uh, the Kurds succeeded to include the idea of legitimacy of Peshmerga not as a militia, but a uh, national army, a army of a uh, nation. So it was a uh, historically moment. Uh, then we see in uh, 2006 and 2010, uh, because of the situation within Iraq and the relation between Kurds in uh, Erbil and, and, and Baghdad, uh, a um, uh, critical moment has started. So Peshmerga was an important element uh, viewed from both Baghdad 
uh, as well as Kurd uh, to in, in this political game. So for the leadership of the Kurdish movement, uh, or the Kurdish administration, better to say, because it's not anymore movement, uh, so PUK and uh, KDP, they viewed a strong uh, Peshmerga, a unified Peshmerga organization as a good element uh, to uh, being uh, in a uh, strong negotiation uh, position. Uh, so uh, at this period, even if uh, they never been capable to realize a fully uh, unification, however, uh, 14 uh, uh, so-called uh, regional guard brigades were established and unified. However, the attempt, uh, the, the problem with this kind of unification was that uh, uh, that uh, uh, this unification was quite, uh, uh, the, uh, well, in, in reality, uh, quite a party, a party politically and partisan. And uh, any time this political party decided to uh, withdraw this, uh, Pesh their Peshmerga forces from this kind of um, unified organization, they, c they could do it. And then we have examples of this kind of withdrawal of Peshmerga force by the decision of a political party from front line, uh, which I will come to it later. So in, 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 in reality, the problem in this case was that the uh, Ministry of Peshmerga functioned more or less as a coordination uh, center between two military forces that have established uh, and agreement to work under an umbrella. So uh, uh, the uh, ministry was uh, viewed as an umbrella rather than a unified institution. Then we have another critical uh, moment in the history uh, of um, Kurd and the role of the Peshmerga in KRG, and it is related to the period, or contemporary to the period of uh, uh, ISIS, Daesh attack on Kurdistan, which they have been able in a short period to, in some regard, the, uh, uh, disintegrate uh, the front line uh, within the KRG. And it was a huge surprise for the Kurdish population and uh, uh, resulted in different uh, form of outrage toward these uh, Kurdish political parties that why after 25 years rule not still being able to uh, well uh, withstand a uh, bunch of uh, Islamist terrorists uh, and it was a huge question for, for, for them. So uh, we see another uh, moment of remobilization. They have been remobilized uh, by the support of Western power, uh, mainly U.S., uh, United Kingdom, as well as uh, Germany, with which they have provided uh, training as uh, well as uh, sponsoring uh, the Peshmerga with military equipment. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, well, uh, another kind of elevation of the role of Peshmerga, because after that, the Peshmerga became a ally of this Western power in defeating ISIS. And Peshmerga has been afterward as well able to, able to challenging Baghdad in order to recapturing huge territorial area, which uh, uh, commonly is referred to as uh, the disputed area uh, uh, between uh, Kurds and Baghdad. So, um, well, we can see this fluctuating uh, journey Peshmerga has been through, uh, through this period. Uh, and the final stage in this regard is actually uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, 16 October 2017, and it is a critical moment for the uh, KRG as well as the Peshmerga because in and in this period, uh, uh, well, we have a uh, quite uh, uh, tense uh, relation between Baghdad and KRG uh, in the aftermath of the uh, 25th uh, September 2017 uh, Kurdish referendum for independent which 93% uh, uh, of the Kurdish people voted for it however uh, 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 it wasn't something that uh, Baghdad and neighboring countries among them Iran and Turkey liked so uh, they uh, uh, well uh, staged a attack on uh, KRG uh, and the problem uh, occurred to the Peshmerga at that stage uh, due to uh, internal division uh, because one fraction which within the uh, PUK, the Patriotic Union, uh, made a kind of secret agreement with the Iraqi government, actually with the Hatch al-Shaabi and the Iranian IRGC uh, to withdraw from uh, Kirkuk and, uh, well, the other uh, disputed territorial area. And uh, this 
again created a massive outrage between the uh, Kurdish population. So in, in, in this regard, I, I will try to just quite briefly relate, uh, yeah, refer to those major uh, uh, challenges Peshmerga has experienced uh, in the process of transformation from a uh, partisan political organization to a depoliticized and national army. One of them is uh, uh, mainly related to uh, the partisan faction that has proved to be a major stumbling block to unifying the Peshmerga and is again related to the uh, relation between uh, KDP and PUK and using or maybe taking Peshmerga as a hostage and using the Peshmerga in their uh, disputed relation uh, and even more critically from the Kurdish public was that uh, these parties have through uh, critical uh, eras, invited Turkish, Iranian, and even Iraqi soldiers to uh, Kurdish soil, which for the case, uh, if not century, they fought with these powers in order to provide the Kurds with some sense of right. So this part, this political party have invited, in reality, the enemy of the Kurds to the soil of the Kurds. So it created massive outrage among the Kurdish people. Um, so another aspect is that actually that uh, it has a Baghdad, these uh, uh, Baghdad Arbil uh, kind of uh, uh, angle, uh, which is the worsening of the Baghdad Arbil relation. Uh, especially since 2012, uh, where uh, Baghdad caught all, uh, uh, well, sending budget to Kurdistan, the 17% budget, and it has weakened the position of uh, KDP, PUK, as well as their attempt of uh, uh, remobilizing the Peshmerga. And it has happened because uh, uh, for, for, for Baghdad, uh, they do not perceive that it is in their interest to have a strong unified Peshmerga force in KRA. Uh, a divided Peshmerga uh, present, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, present less of a threat to the interest of the rest of uh, Iraq, while also uh, the Iraqi government official uh, to treat uh, the KRG as a subordinate actor. So you can see in this regard the institution which Kurds have established themselves has been subordinated uh, by uh, uh, the political parties of Kurd who uh, claimed for the case to uh, fight for the Kurdish right. And another aspect is, is again a regional uh, kind of aspect of challenge created by regional power, uh, namely Iran and, uh, and Turkey. Uh, for example, one could point to the role of Turkey and Iran uh, for uh, being destructive and subversive in this regard. These two regional power with greatest economic and political influence in the uh, KRA do not perceive a unified Peshmerga to be in their interests. With their own Kurdish population and Kurdish issue, it is in their interest for the territory to remain riven without unified forces or unified institution. Because they see it, such a consolidation and institution would be seen by uh, Kurds of other parts of Kurdistan as exemplar uh, by yeah, this uh, population, for example, in Turkey or Iran. Uh, so in this regard, each has developed clientelist relation with the parties, and it is able to leverage actions that would serve to undermine any reform process in the military or civilian process. Just to uh, briefly conclude, uh, reflecting on the uh, evolution of the Peshmerga forces of KRI allows to argue that the existence and evolution of Peshmerga as a non-state army has contributed greatly to promoting the Kurdish movement as a long-standing and resilient movement and in the uh, post-2003 Iraq's Kurdish relation to Baghdad, the existence of Peshmerga has strengthened Iraqi Kurds' negotiating position. So, however, deploying the Peshmerga as mentioned by PUK and KDP, which just remind main political party of Iraqi Kurd, in solving internal dispute of these parties has resulted in civil war uh, and institutionalization of division as well as channelizing corruption and clientelist relation between KRG and the Kurdish society. Any attempt of transforming has in reality uh, been uh, a result of realization of existence of external threat uh, to the KRG and the U.S. Uh, encouragement. So in reality, this step hasn't been taken uh, due to the good political will of PUK and KDP. 
Uh, so in taking into account the public's view on Peshmerga, the Peshmerga has a symbolic and heroic reputation uh, among the Kurds, not just in Iraqi Kurdistan, but actually in all parts of Kurdistan, in Turkey, in Iran, in Turkey, in Syria, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, however, in the long run, repu uh, repeating failure in unifying and depoliticizing Peshmerga would leave negative impact on the public view on Peshmerga. If the depolitization of the Peshmerga forces in Iraqi Kurdistan fail in future, what once viewed by the Kurdish society and the public as their protector and liberator would in future be remembered as a spoiler of Kurdish dream of independence. As uh, just to finalize, here you see it is Kirkuk, the Kurdish flag, by some Iraqi soldier, Hachi Shabi, and I don't know really who is. And you can see how it has been treated. The Kurdish flag, you know, is a, uh, is a, is a proud and a, uh, well, symbol of a nation. So it means that the way the Kurds actually, uh, this political party in Kirkuk, have dealt with each other, making, making secret, uh, you know, uh, agreement with, for example, Baghdad, how they have ruined uh, the achievement. So, yeah, thank you very much. Shukran Jazeeran. And now we have three conditions that are similar or similar or similar in the last situation, which is the Peshmerga, that the militia has changed to a state of war. In the situation before that, we have a state of war that has changed the militia. ثم حصلت فيها مشاكل وعندنا الآن في هنا ميليشيا تريد أن تحل محل الجيش الأسئلة لكم Somebody give him Can you get him Thank you very much. I have an intervention to Mr. Garrett. The Peshmerga, it seems that the sources that we have used are from the part of the Peshmerga only or the Kurdish political parties only. It seems that you have not communicated with the Iraqi government for you to know all the details that he mentioned in his paper. So first, the, Pesh Ber the Peshmerga, they fought the Iraqi army in the Iranian. Uh, yeah, they fought against the Iraqi army in the Iranian uh, war. So to have regular forces with a foreign enemy state and to enter into battles against the country to which they belong. Secondly, the Peshmerga, they cooperated with the American occupying forces and they have occupied Kirkuk and Mosul. And they were two groups, two corps, uh, and they have controlled the, their, uh, their arms. And the picture that we have seen of the different tanks, these are Iraqi tanks of uh, uh, Iraqi armies and now they have been used by the Peshmerga. So there are no contested areas uh, so, or disputed areas. Uh, so the regimes uh, or federal systems, uh, if we try to get to know them throughout history, there is no federal system as we have in Iraq. Uh, but uh, it seems that this does not please uh, our uh, friends, the Kurds, in the northern part of Iraq. There are a number of requirements uh, since 2003 till date. Uh, most, uh, the, most of the Iraqi resources have been taken to the Kurdistan region, but the northern, the middle part, and the southern part are very poor. They have not been rehabilitated. There are no airports or anything as such. So my piece of advice to you is to get to get other sources of information for, for you to know the other positions of the other areas as well. Uh, 
In the name of God, the most compassionate, I would like to thank the Arab Center for Research and Policy for this very important session. My name is Ahmad Salah Bayoumi. I am a researcher and a PhD student in the paper that was presented by Dr. Ali Hamid. Hamid Ali, sorry. He mentioned in one of the slides that uh, the forces uh, uh, the rapid intervention forces he talked about the uh, resources that they receive so I'm going to speak uh, first, thank in you English. so much for the uh, fascinating presentations I really enjoyed them uh, I have a question to Hamid and a question to Tiana. Hamid, thank you again for uh, taking this on short notice. Uh, highly appreciated. Just uh, one issue regarding, you mentioned 130 battles that the, uh, the Sudanese army failed to achieve victory. This is staggering by, by, any, uh, by any competitive measure I can imagine at the moment. Uh, so why? You know, uh, my question is: uh, the, the, Is it high military effectiveness on the militia side, or like, you know, the question is why simply? Uh, and then the, the, there's a point that you'd not elaborate on the point of Boko Haram. Like, I, I didn't, I didn't get that. Are the Bo, are Boko Haram is he recruiting from Boko Haram, or is Boko Haram recruiting from his um, soldiers? Uh, Tiana, fascinating presentation. Thank you very much again. Um, just um, that's a classic justice versus peace situation, which we face a lot in the, in the, here in the region. Uh, you need to make one of the choices, either to, uh, for a time frame, you know, to, to, to sustain peace or to keep the social peace and then not to, not, to annoy the guys with the guns, uh, you sacrifice justice for a while and then you try to do that at a later stage. The, the picture you, you showed, I can, uh, that, that picture exactly happened in Tunisia 2012 and happened in Egypt 2013 with the soldiers blocking roads and uh, you know trying to mobilize against the uh, uh, political so m my question really is the the current status um, is there a Serbian formula a magical formula that the current president uh, is trying to implement and how successful is it in if, if, if there was thank you yes my question is Tatiana uh, first question is, uh, was there a political frame under which these militias, uh, the Serbian militias work? That means, uh, do they have a political trend or a political party? Uh, second, do they have foreign relations? What about foreign intervention in Bosnia, given I still remember that uh, there was uh, a support from Iran to the Bosnia and fighters from Hezbollah Lebanon went to Bosnia. A leader called Abu Ali al Bosna. Still, uh, people remember him. And uh, from Turkey as well. And still remember the visit of uh, former Prime Minister Tanso Chiller of uh, Turkey and uh, the late Prime Minister of uh, Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, to Sarajevo. So, what about the foreign intervention? Uh, a third question. You said that uh, DDR did not take place inside uh, Serbia. That means it has taken place in uh, Montenegro, Bosnia, or uh, and Kosovo. Why? I have a question to Alan. What are the sources of funding, military funding, for the Peshmerga? What are the sources of military funding for the Peshmerga? What are the sources of military funding for the Peshmerga? What are the sources of military funding for the Peshmerga? What are the sources of military funding for the Peshmerga? Where do they get their funding when it comes army? Yeah, military funding. Yeah. So do the Peshmerga fear that a Karkuk situation would be uh, reiterated again or lived again. Uh, 
Dr. Jamal Abdelrahman, researcher, with regard to the paper that was presented by, doc by, by Dr. Hamid, there is no doubt that the internal and external situation has accelerated the role played by the rapid intervention forces. But there is a point. The situation in Yemen, and uh, after that, there was some commitment vis-a-vis -vis Yemen, and this has led to the recruitment of a number of military personnel that used to work for the armed forces and the police, and then they have been re-recruited. So this was this was the identity. Not all of them are from Daifir, and the commanders are from the uh, armed forces. They are graduates uh, from military police, uh, military sorry uh, colleges. And this is a very important point. The second point is that the situation in Sudan after the population rep, uh, pop, popular revolution, so there was n no military regime that would have continued, irrespective of the situation on the ground. But another military government, this is going to be very difficult. Maybe Hamidji can be, can enter in coalition with the political party, perhaps. Party perhaps. And these forces are most uh, from the neighboring countries, such as Chad and so on and so forth. I think the point needs to be reviewed, needs to be revisited. And there are so many reports by the United Nations said that Sudan has not participated in Libya and uh, there was a company from uh, the Emirates and uh, Sudan had nothing to do with that. The question that I would like to pose, do you think that uh, these forces have achieved some stability in those conflict zones and have perhaps limited uh, irregular migration? And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, three great uh, presentations, uh, very, very, uh, I mean, fascinating panel. And three cases. Uh, 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 Hamid Ali, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I understand that uh, the agents of Hamidi, you know, the personalismo, you know, the personal charismatic leadership is the key, I think, explaining everything in your case. And in Ellen, uh, Ellen uh, in your case, the Peshmerga, you know, historical roots, uh, tribal dynamics, uh, and uh, the fight against both uh, the central power within the state and also transnational characteristics of the fight is very important. And in the, uh, uh, the, the, the case, uh, the much more ethnic uh, religious dynamics in a uh, much more institutionalized setting. So very good uh, to presentations uh, that can uh, provide us a kind of comparative uh, perspective. My, questions, uh, my question is to uh, Tiana and to Hamid Ali. Uh, International Criminal Court. You're, in, your, in your case, a Milosevic guy, you know, he was uh, processed and I think he got a punishment. Uh, and in uh, Hamid Ali, uh, you said that Hamadi is on the brink of being processed by the International Criminal Court. So in the cases of violent non-state actors at the global governance level, we have only one mechanism, you know, this uh, to, I would say, contain the escalation of violence. This mechanism is international criminal court and the processing of those uh, elites or leaders uh, of those uh, organizations with that. So uh, I want you to get your opinions about that. To, to what extent this mechanism is uh, effective? And it's the mechanism only can provide uh, uh, not collective but personal, you know, uh, legal uh, trials. So what about the idea of getting a kind of collective, uh, you know, legal imposition at the global governance level? Uh, what would you say about that? So, uh, your opinions about uh, this uh, related to Milosevic case and Hamadi case. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Hamid and uh, to the paper about the Bashmerga.
So a soldier or a soldier or an officer in Sudan goes through military training and also national education and then that person becomes an officer and after uh, uh, paying allegiance to the state but these forces these movements these militias do not go through through such uh, a, a process uh, the doctrine is a doctrine of interest for those militias but for an officer it is uh, the uh, doctrine is the interest of the state it is the state and if there is no military with if the, if the military has no allegiance to the state this is going to be very dangerous indeed the second point that i would like to talk about now it seems that the middle east is going to be ruled by internal proxies uh, uh, proxies with external members. There are a number of countries that work with militias. They try to change regimes. They are supported by the US, Israel, and so on. And I think that this is going to uh, put impediments for any country that wants to move towards democracy. The last point that I would like to talk about. Peshmerga forces is the main voice and symbol when it comes to the independence of the Kurds. Unfortunately, I have lived in Iraq for six years prior to the war six years and then six years after the war unfortunately our brothers the kurds their link or their ties with the us and the, and israel is very strong or but nationally speaking they have to be iraqis i'm not talking about their ethnicity but from a national perspective patriotic perspective they have to be tied with Iraq and not against Iraq. So that is why Iraq is not going to allow them achieve their main objective. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentations. I have three questions, um, two to Alan and one to Hamid Ali. To Alan, um, what kind of steps have been already undertaken to repair trust between PUK and KDP Peshmerga, especially after what happened in Kirkuk? And second, Falah Al Fayyad had recently talks with Kurdish officials um, for some potential formalizing security sector cooperation between Peshmerga and uh, even Hashid forces in um, disputed territories, do you see this as something like possible? And so Hamid Ali, as you, as you portrayed this evolution towards an army, from a militia towards an army, was the way I understood you mainly driven by their will to capture more state resources, but what role does ideology or even like group identity play in their positioning or understanding of the role of the state in, in Sudan? Thank you. Thank you. I now give uh, three minutes each to the speaker to respond, starting with Tiana. As for the, the pers first question related to the, this uh, uh, justice versus security dilemma, I think in the um, case of Serbia, um, it was not in a way on the political elites to decide where the scale would go. And um, according to at least my judgment, I think that um, the, the justice, if you look in the international mechanisms which stood behind these two principles, the justice became uh, in a way at least in a shorter more important than the, than the stability. Having in mind that the um, uh, disarmament and uh, demobilization was not part of, for Serbia, was not part of Dayton Peace Agreement, and was not part, again, uh, in the Kumanovo uh, Peace Agreement, which ended the war in Kosovo. The Kumanovo Peace Agreement, and that's also part of the question I'll come later, is said only that Kosovo Liberation Army 
was supposed to be disarmed, not even mentioning the, some of the, some of the, though in a lesser extent, Serbian paramilitary participating in Kosovo. On the other hand, the demands for transitional justice um, were harshly uh, uh, put on uh, uh, Serbia um, um, by the establishment of the, and again, I'll come to that question as well, uh, by the, through the establishment of an international uh, special tribunal, practically, for the, the crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia. Why, at least um, despite the fact that the, these criminal, um, the criminal justice per se, like the, the uh, retributive justice is imperfect. Um, uh, it still did bring some, but with the time, some justice to the victims, not only of the victims of the um, committed to the um, uh, um, uh, Bosniak side, but also to the Croats, to the Serbs, etc. Uh, so um, I would have my opinion that maybe we can discuss about it later, how it should be and how there are ways to tailor the, the, including the peace agreements, but also the entire international peace building enterprise to, to make them go more in parallel than successive, because this is how we make vacuums, which are extremely important. The, the more the DDR process is delayed, uh, the, time, the more time passes, it's more difficult to hold people accountable. Uh, so um, these things should go in, a, in the um, same way. And as for the current president, I don't think he has some magical stick, but it seems so uh, in terms of the transformation of the entire society, though it seems so because our current uh, president as well was um, um, in a certain way involved in a, uh, in a war rhetorics uh, uh, in the, um, uh, in the, he was part of the Serbian Radical Party, which was uh, one of the proponents, so to say, promoters of the of the wars war in uh, um, uh, Bosnia. However, maybe if you look at his example, we can see that people perhaps could change, but this would also need uh, some deeper look and deeper reflections. As for the 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 other questions, as for the pol current political framework for them, so there is no political party uh, which is. Um, comprised of former paramilitaries. Even if, um, in comparisons to Croatia and Bosnia, even the veteran asso associations in Serbia is, are very weak. So in, in Croatia, for example, more veteran associations represent a strong veto power when it comes to, have a strong veto power when it comes to issues of transitional justice, etc. In Serbia, they are almost non-existent and, and, and silenced. Um, um, you have some members of the either who were directly or indirectly involved uh, in, um, in, the, um, uh, uh, in the paramilitary formations uh, still on the political scene, including the voice of Shashil. We had uh, the leader of the Serbian Radical Party who was actually uh, um, uh, tried in ICTY, um, still in a political light, even in a parliament, which I don't think is a good uh, message to send to the, to the society. Um, however, there is no, like, at this point, the, the rest of the um, uh, unit for special operation after the assassination during the Operation Saber, there was, like, the, 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 the unit was officially disbanded. And um, those who were not um, um, sentenced or accused for any human rights abuses, they were introduced into the uh, gender Mary and uh, special anti-terrorist unit. So practically some of the remnants of this unit are still in the police forces of the country. Um, I'll, I'll shorten it. Um, so I already said about the transitional justice, so this was really harsh conditionality. Serbian EU integration process during the 90s was practically uh, based on the condition of cooperating with the ICTY. Uh, so once it, this was the, the major condition, all other conditions were sidelined until the Serbia started participating with the, with the ICTY. Uh, and as for the rest of the countries, there was some DDR process in Bosnia. That's, that's the, the, the only country which had some, in a way, not compre comprehensive, but some DDR process because the World Bank was involved in this. There were programs which lasted for years which tried to, to um, incentivize the former ex-combatants to, to come and surrender arms and to um, enter different training uh, vocational programs for better reintegration into civilian life. In Kosovo, there were some uh, uh, programs under the NATO framework, uh, but um, Serbia and Montenegro and Croatia also, like this is like, this was completely out of the picture. The final question was about um, the criminal, the, the collective guilt. Um, as for the, um, um, so Serbia is perhaps the same as Rwanda are specific cases because special international tribunals were established for trying these, uh, for, for these um, crimes. So perhaps um, 
the legacy of the ICTY is still disputed because the sides have not been reconciled, though it is a question whether reconciliation should be a name of any uh, criminal court. Uh, um, the, every side thinks that she was the one who was suffered, like that uh, its, uh, it's uh, uh, nationals were most tried, is, but, and so do you have some kind of uh, race in the victimization among the, the sides? However, I would say that the ICTY, not only for Serbia, but in general for the um, um, criminal justice and holding the individuals at least uh, uh, accountable, has done a lot for the international criminal law, uh, despite, many, f despite many, many flaws. Uh, because uh, we saw leaders of the countries tried, and, uh, and that's something which was, has never happened before in such a way. As for Milosevic, we can talk about, uh, about this later, but he, he passed away in 2006, so he never got a verdict. There were later uh, uh, the verdict for Ratko Mladic, the general of uh, Army of Republika Srpska. You had discussions whether his, his, um, um, tri uh, his verdict actually, in a way, liberated Milosevic, for, but this is something that's a matter of dispute. Serbia as a country, uh, um, um, was um, uh, not sentenced for genocide in, in uh, 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 not a, uh, the verdict said that Serbia did not commit genocide in Srebrenica, though Serbia was uh, uh, held accountable for not preventing something that she knew. But as a country, Serbia is liberated from the accusation that uh, participated in a genocide in Srebrenica. Sorry. Okay, thank you very much for all your comments and questions. I really appreciate it. I'll start with the honorary gentleman uh, about the uh, comments. Uh, well, as I mentioned, yes, uh, the Kurdish Peshmerga uh, of Iraq uh, during the Iranian Iraqi war, yes, they were uh, fighting the Iraqi government uh, with the Iranian. Um, and it is not new, it wasn't a new uh, like uh, kind of development. It's happened. And Kurds, since the establishment of Iraq, uh, rebelled you know, in 1920. So as I put the uh, slide, Sheikh Mahmoud Berzinji, before the establishment of Iraq, refused as Kurds to be part of Iraq, okay? They even actually privileged to stay with the Ottoman Empire. So it's not something new. And secondly, actually we uh, have to, I, I have learned history and I'm teaching history. Uh, and uh, actually I'm a product of this movement, okay? Uh, by the way, uh, the honorary gentleman knows that 4,000 Iraqi Kurdish village has been destroyed in a matter of one year in the 1980s. 8,000 Kurdish people in one hour have been killed by the Iraqi government by using chemical weapon. In the campaign of Anfal, 182,000 Kurdish people, still no one knows where are their body. They have been killed. Okay, I think uh, this Kurdish problem is a product of this kind of issue. And this, this, this ter disputed territory area, uh, yes, it is actually even recognized by the Iraqi government post Saddam Hussein. That's why we have this uh, uh, Madai uh, 140 decree in order to find a solution, uh, normalize the situation, and try to de arabize the Kirkuk and this area and then have a referendum. So I think it's not something, a new creation, uh, and the name of disputed area is not uh, something I found, or maybe Kurt. It is something it has been since 1960, when uh, actually uh, first time Barzani negotiated with Abdul Karim Qasem. So Kirkuk was an issue. And then with Saddam, again in 1971, when he was foreign minister, Again, Kirkuk was an issue. In the 1991, after the uh, creation of KRG, Saddam actually offered a uh, autonomy without Kirkuk. Kurt rejected. So it's not a new situation. So it is a uh, many decades product of many decades problem, uh, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. And secondly, uh, to this gentleman, financing Peshmerga until 2003, Peshmerga was found by themselves. And then after 2003, as I said, uh, Peshmerga was constitutionally recognized as a regional. So uh, the deal was that the Iraqi government should uh, give some percentage of the uh, budget to the Peshmerga, like treating with the, like as other security uh, forces uh, of the Iraqi government. And uh, because not uh, receiving this budget, uh, we can see actually could complain a lot in this period. And we can see during the 2014-17, one of the main issue was that say, okay, 
We are fighting together with Hash al-Shaabi, with the Iraqi security forces, but we are not equi equ equally. So at that time, where one Iraqi soldier, one Hash al-Shaabi militia received 1,000 pounds, the salary of the Peshmerga was 500,000, uh, sorry, dollars. The salary of the Peshmerga was 500, and for those now, uh, you know, uh, familiar with the situation of uh, KRZ, since 2014, we have example of five, six months, P Peshmerga haven't received any penny from the government, from the Kurdish even, you know, no salary. So they were fought, uh, fighting the ISIS without receiving any salary. Uh, by the way, the American and the international, uh, the British, as well the Germany, uh, well, uh, been uh, sponsored uh, financially Peshmerga in this regard. I hope this is the answer to your question. The honorary gentleman as well. Uh, well, uh, is, 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 a, is a good question. Uh, uh, you uh, ask me uh, regarding uh, the relation with uh, well I'm not familiar that much with how much Kurds uh, in Iraq are or are, are not but let's say theoretically yes they are in relation with Israel how the Iraqi government and the army is equipped by the American so why should you complain about having a Kurdish relation with American um, uh, and and secondly I can name dozens of Arab country participated in the Arab-Israeli war, now they have embassies, Israeli embassies in their, uh, you know, uh, uh, capital cities. So why should it be issue? So far, it's not on the cast of the Palestinian. So why should it be issue? And could have a relation with Israel? I think it's a good question. We should discuss. You know, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, just very quickly uh, for the for the question from. Uh, uh, Ahmed Sarhab Ayumi about the information is where I got those information. Actually, this information I did not talk about the Junaid uh, uh, conglomerate. This is the business that are involving the gold trade, and this is the, with the UAE. And basically, uh, we got this is from the actually directly we contacted people that get this data, and I think also the global witnesses also reporting this data even though it seemed to be the same source that gave the data to global witness, is the same source that I was getting the data. So, but it's still open to the, to the further verification, but this is roughly the numbers. Uh, uh, for, the, for the question from uh, uh, Dr. Omar Ashur, uh, thank you so much, Omar. I just said it earlier. You made my work very easy because you gave me, you sent me the questions. So I just tried to find an answer. So just like an assignment for me. So I thank you very much. I said that at the beginning of my talk. Uh, about the battlefield, uh, what has happened is actually I have this record of this battlefield from my visit there to this uh, to this rebel movement, and from the commander who are doing those ones. But if you look for the Sudan government, since the rebellion in Darfur started from 2004 until uh, 2010, the government has never achieved any victory in any of the confrontation because the guys are using asymmetrical warfare. They borrow a tactics from Chad. And the tactics of the Chad is you just use the pickup truck and attack the, and you break the, the box for the army and they just go. And you try to attack them when you are coming very close to them. You don't, you don't make an arm, you know, not fire from a distance. Direct contact, you go there and just run over them. And that's why the army could not able to engage with them. But if they go with a conventional warfare, these guys, they cannot stand a day. So that's why they were, the government was not effective, and this is the whole purpose, went and create this militia uh, to go on and, and follow the same tactics. Uh, and that's the one that the government able to, to make a breakthrough, uh, because the, the, they have a more, more power, more intelligence, and more, uh, more support. So that's one thing. Uh, regarding about the Boko Haram, because if you remember, Boko Haram was being basically squeezed in Niger, and squeezed in Chad, and, and Cameroon, and this area. So they left, they fled. When they fled, they came in, and they integrated into these forces, and became part of it. Of course, everybody has his own agenda, but they are sitting and embedded in those, into those forces, and, and, and they are still, still there. Uh, that's why there is no control on this force. It's not a coherent force, because inside, it's also it has their own, their own dynamics. Uh, uh, for the question from, uh, from uh, Dr. Jamal is, uh, uh, you are correct. The commanders, the government, one of the ways to control this force is they put 
military officers to be heading those units and, and divisions and etc. So they are. That's the way that they are putting the leverage. But also the, the way that this Hamet is working on, he tried to buy the allegiance of these officers with, with a lot of money. And, and that will change the purpose of why they are there. So there will be no difference if they are uh, in the army. Uh, because w the first tactic is this guy, the army officer, is going to give him a direction to get away and they might surrender even. But I think that's not going to be uh, something that is people could rely on it. Uh, for the, uh, 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 the other question that is, uh, it is true. These units are starting in Darfur as one unit and coming originally from the, from the certain tribes without going to the details. And later on, it became an occupation for everybody looking for a job and so many people applying for it to go to Yemen and et cetera. And that's why the number is well. But if you look for the Hemetis family, it's no longer than 3,000 people, for example. If you look for his own tribe, it's not going to exceed more than eight to 10,000. Uh, but now we're talking about 80,000 or 60,000. So you are correct, there are so many that are there. Is it created some sort of stability? Relatively speaking, you might say, uh, if you are, uh, uh, one thing also I will just say is, Sudanese overall, they are fatigued from the war. War fatigue is kicking everybody. That's true. Uh, in terms of the human trafficking, whether they are good, that's a big question. EU saw that is they gave him a lot of money, about $120 million from EU money. It's come to, the, uh, it come to, this, uh, uh, to this force. And this force is, I remember we have a meeting with the UN and Mo Ibrahim telling them, you guys, you are so stupid. You did the, the most stupidest thing in the world to give the money to this to this process of the ginger wheat. So they give that money, uh, but he will become a smuggler himself. So he kill, you know, he get rid of the small smugglers, he become the biggest smuggler. So he's the one that doing it. So whether the smuggling in, into Europe is stopped, I doubt it, if that was stopped. Uh, for the, uh, the question from, uh, from Maitin regarding the, the ICC and the role of the ICC, uh, I think, look, the ICC is, for the non-state actor, it's not that as effective. Because I was, one time I was talking to this rebel leader, I told him don't do the war crime because you're gonna go to the ICC. And he said, am I going to be famous? I said, yeah, you're gonna be famous. He said, okay, then I don't mind. So, so, so this is, uh, no, but it's gonna be effective for the state actor. As the president of, or the head of a state, Al-Bashir become a very good life lesson for everybody to think about whether you want to go that route or not. So, but it's supposed to be part of the global governing system that will be, you know, uniformity, not selective. That's what that is. I think, but I am in the support of the ICC. I want them to see they have more power. Uh, for the, uh, the question that raised by, uh, uh, by uh, Sadiq Ibn Nafisa, I agree with you. Uh, you know, people go to indoctrinate it into the military, they come out with a, with a discipline, a structure, they have allegiance. But today you are bringing militias that are tend to be diluting all those principles and values. So it will be very dangerous for the national unity and, and this, is a, this is a disease that we have been created. I'm not blaming anyone, I'm blaming the elites in Khartoum who are creating that mess. And they create this monster and now they got to deal with this monster. Uh, the, last, uh, the last question is uh, uh, from Enad about, uh, uh, about the, uh, the, I don't want to talk about Israeli things because now it become, you know, we are also, we are getting very close there, huh? in Khartoum. So, 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 it's, uh, so I can't say anything. Uh, regarding the last one is uh, whether the evolution is, we are moving the resources is the driven and the most essential factor, and whether the ideology has a place in that one. Uh, these guys have no ideology, but they have another ideology, which is you capitalizing on the grievances, exclusion, marginalization, and this is going to be a rallying point where people could be getting it together, and Hamid is now playing that card, and it seems to be, to some extent, he's very effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we... Uh have to conclude now and see you all tomorrow.